Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello there, and welcome to the Klein Museum, which was the actual home of Mr. Klein and his family before he went on to be the famous author we all know him as today. Before we get started, there are some questions I'd like to ask you for our records. Would that be okay with you, sir? Yes, I'd be more than happy to help out. That's great, thank you. First of all, what's your name? My full name is John Horton. John Hort, could you spell your surname for me, please? Of course, it's H-O-R-T-O-N, Horton. It's actually quite a popular name where I come from. And where exactly was it that you come from? I just flew in from London yesterday specifically to come visit here. That's so exciting. Well, it's great to have such a dedicated fan turn up at the museum. The next thing I need to ask you is for your phone number, as our director has plans to take some special exhibits on tour next year. That sounds very interesting. I definitely like to be kept informed about that. My number is 064-145-354. 064-145-354, is that right? That's it, exactly. Got it, thanks. And next, could you just tell me if it's your first visit to the Klein Museum? Yes. Well, actually, my parents did bring me here when I was quite young, and I don't actually remember it. But technically, this is my second time being here. Oh, my. So your whole family are Klein fans then? Yes, definitely. It was my parents who got me started on him. And what's your favourite Klein book? I love all of his popular ones like Heyday and The Knocking. Uh, but my absolute favourite has got to be The Final Push, which wasn't as popular as the others, but really left me with a lasting impression. I know exactly what you mean. It really is surprising that it isn't better known. And while you're visiting, will you require the services of our in-house photographer? No, that won't be necessary. Are you aware that personal cameras are not allowed into the museum? Oh, really? I wasn't, actually. Well, in that case, I suppose I'd better. How much does it cost? One photo is $5, but you can get five for just $10. Which option would suit you best? I'll go with one photo, as I really only need it as a reminder of my visit here. This is a bit embarrassing, actually. What's that? I need to put today's date on the form, but I actually can't remember what date it is today. That's nothing to worry about. Well. I flew in yesterday, which was the 15th of February. So that makes today the 16th of February. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to 10. And now let's get started with the tour. As you can see, the main entrance is furnished with these standard double doors from the era and lead us directly to the guest room, which is the largest room in the house. This is, in fact, the very same room where he signed his very first publishing deal back in 1894. At the opposite end of the room, we have the fireplace in the center where he and his family would gather during the cold winters to keep warm. On the right of the fireplace is the entrance to the utility room, but unfortunately, we don't have any of the objects that were stored there by the Klein family, as the house has changed hands on several occasions before it was finally turned into a museum in his honor. Then, 
On the left of the door that leads into the kitchen, you can see this hatch that was used as the serving window, as was customary, so as not to have the staff interacting with the guests. If you follow me through to the kitchen here, you can see the stove is placed directly against the wall at the back of the fireplace. And this is because when the fire is lit, the heat can be used in the oven of the stove. And on the left, the sink is located directly under the window so that this area was well illuminated for preparing food and washing the crockery. At the back of the kitchen is the doorway to the bedroom. In those days, beds weren't as popular as they are now. So people slept on thin wooden mats laid on the ground, like the ones you see here, and the whole family would sleep here together, except for on the coldest nights, when they would move to the guest room to benefit from whatever heat was left coming from the evening fire. At the back, you'll notice this little cubby, which may look like an ensuite at first, but is, in fact, the office of our great Mr. Klein, as he found this to be the quietest location in the house and could focus on his work without interruption. Finally, if you could just follow me back through the kitchen, here we can exit through the back door of the house to the woodshed where the Klein family stored, well, obviously, their wood. However, it was the staff that would have been the only ones that really had any reason to be back here. And that pretty much concludes our tour. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. The first thing is that clean energy has been increasing. This is electricity from clean energy sources over the last 20 years. But when you look at the percentage of global electricity from clean energy sources, it's actually been in decline from 36% to 31%. And if you care about climate change, you've got to go in the opposite direction to 100% of our electricity from clean energy sources as quickly as possible. Now, you might wonder, come on, how much could five percentage points of global electricity be? Well, it turns out to be quite a bit. It's the equivalent of 60 nuclear plants the size of Diablo Canyon, California's last nuclear plant, or 900 solar farms the size of Topaz, which is one of the biggest solar farms in the world and, and certainly our biggest in California. Well, a big part of this is just simply that fossil fuels are increasing faster than clean energy. And that's understandable. There's just a lot of poor countries that are still using wood and charcoal as their main source of energy, and they need modern fuels. But there's something else going on, which is that one of those clean energy sources in particular has actually been on the decline in absolute terms, not just relatively. And that's nuclear. You can see its generation has declined 7% over the last... 10 years. Now, solar and wind have been making huge strides, and so you hear a lot of talk about how it doesn't really matter because solar and wind is going to make up the difference. But the data says something different. When you combine all the electricity from solar and wind, you see it actually barely makes up half of the decline from nuclear. Well, let's take a closer look in the United States. Over the last couple of years, really 2013, 2014, we prematurely retired four nuclear power plants. They were almost entirely replaced with fossil fuels. And so the consequence was that we wiped out almost as much clean energy electricity that we get from solar. And it's not unique to us. I mean, 
people think of California as a clean energy and climate leader, but when we looked at the data, what we found is that in fact California reduced emissions more slowly than the national average between 2000 and 2015. What about Germany? They're doing a lot of clean energy. But when you look at the data, German emissions have actually been going up since 2009, and there's really not anybody who's going to tell you that they're going to meet their climate commitments in 2020. The reason isn't hard to understand. Solar and wind provide power about 10 to 20 percent of the time, which means that when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, you still need power for your hospitals, your homes, your cities, your factories. And while batteries have made some really cool improvements lately, the truth is that they're just never going to be as efficient as the electrical grid. Every time you put electricity into a battery and you take it out, you lose about 20 to 40 percent of the to 40 percent of the power. That's why when in California we try to deal with all the solar we've brought online, we now get about 10 percent of our electricity from solar. You have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. When the sun goes down and people come home from work and turn on their air conditioners and their TV sets and every other appliance in the house, we need a lot of natural gas backup. So what we've been doing is stuffing a lot of natural gas into the side of a mountain, and that worked pretty well for a while. But then late last year, it sprung a leak. This is Aliso Canyon, and so much methane gas was released. It was the equivalent of putting a half a million cars on the road. It basically blew through all of our climate commitments for the year. Well, what about India? Sometimes you have to go places to really get the right data. So we traveled to India a few months ago. We met with all the top officials, solar, nuclear, the rest. And what they told us is they said we're actually having more serious problems than both Germany and California. We don't have backup. We start of it. We say we want to get to 100 gigawatts by 2022, but last year we did just five, and the year before that we did five. So. Let's just take a closer look at nuclear. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has looked at the carbon content of all these different fuels, and nuclear comes out really low. It's actually lower even than solar, and nuclear obviously provides a lot of power. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, during a year, a single plant can provide power 92 percent of the time. And what's interesting is that when you look at countries that have deployed different kinds of clean energies. There's only a few that have done so at a pace consistent with dealing with the climate crisis. So nuclear seems like a pretty good option, but there's this big problem with it, which all of you, I'm sure, are aware of, which is that people really don't like it.、Uh, there was a study, a survey done of people around the world, not just in the United States or Europe,、uh, about a year and a half ago, and what they found is that nuclear found is that nuclear is actually one of the least popular forms of energy. Even oil is more popular than nuclear, and、uh, while nuclear kind of edges out coal, the thing is, people don't really fear coal in the same way that they feared nuclear, which really operates on our unconscious. So, what is it that we fear? I mean, there's really three things. There's the safety of the plants themselves, the fears that they're going to melt down and cause damage. There's the waste from them, and then there's the association with weapons. And I think, understandably, engineers look at those. Concerns, and they want to look for technological fixes. I mean, that's why Bill Gates is in China developing advanced reactors. That's why 40 different entrepreneurs are working on this problem. And and I myself have been very excited about it. We did a report how to make nuclear cheap. In particular, the thorium reactor shows a lot of promise. And so, when the climate scientist James Hansen asked if I wanted to go to China with him and look at the Chinese advanced nuclear program, I jumped at the chance. We were there with MIT and UC Berkeley engineers. And you know, I had in my mind that the Chinese would be able to do with nuclear what they did with so many other things: just start to crank out small nuclear reactors on assembly lines, ship them up like iPhones or MacBooks, and send them around the world. I would get one home in Berkeley.、Um, but what I found was somewhat different. The, the presentations were all very exciting and very promising. They have multiple reactors that they're working on. The time came for the thorium reactor, and a bunch of us were excited. They went through the whole presentation. They got to the timeline, 
And they said, we're going to have a thorium molten salt reactor ready for sale to the world by 2040. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions. So let's look, though, at the four choices that we are making right now. Um, the first one, the most, by far the most consumed uh, seafood in America and in much of the West, is shrimp. Shrimp in the wild is a wild product. It's a terrible product. Five, 10, 15 pounds of wild fish are regularly killed to bring one pound of shrimp to the market. They're also incredibly fuel inefficient to bring to the market. In a recent study that was produced out of Dalhousie University, it was found that dragging it for shrimp is one of the most carbon-intensive ways of fishing that you can find. So you can farm them, and people do farm them, and they farm them a lot in this very area. Problem is, the place where you farm shrimp is in these wild habitats, in mangrove forests. Now look at those lovely roots coming down. Those are the things that hold soil together, protect coasts, create habitats for all sort of young fish, young shrimp, all sorts of things that are important to this environment. Well, this is what happens to a lot of coastal mangrove forests. We've lost millions to a lot of coastal mangrove forests. We've lost millions of acres of coastal mangroves over the last 30 or 40 years. That rate of destruction has slowed, but we're still in a major mangrove deficit. The other thing that's going on here is a phenomenon um, that the filmmaker Mark Benjamin called Grinding Nemo. This phenomenon is very, very relevant to anything that you've ever seen on a tropical reef. Because what's going on right now, we have shrimp draggers dragging for shrimp, catching a huge amount of bycatch. That bycatch, in turn, gets ground up and turned into shrimp food. And sometimes, many of these vessels, manned by slaves, are catching these so-called trash fish, fish that we would love to see on a reef, grinding them up and turning them into shrimp feed. An ecosystem literally eating itself and spitting out shrimp. The next most consumed seafood um, in America and also throughout the West is tuna. So tuna um, is this ultimate global fish. These huge management areas have to be observed in order for management area called a regional fisheries management organization is called ICAT, the International Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. Uh, the great naturalist Carl Safina uh, once called it the uh, international conspiracy to catch all the tunas. Um, of course, we've seen incredible improvement in ICAT in the last few years. Uh, there is total room for improvement, but it remains to be said that tuna is a global fish, and to manage it, we have to manage the globe. Well, we could also try to grow tuna, but tuna is a spectacularly bad animal for aquaculture. Many people don't know this, but tuna are warm-blooded. They can heat their bodies 20 degrees above ambient temperature. They can swim at over 40 miles an hour. So pretty much eliminates all the advantages of farming a fish, right? A farmed fish is, or a fish is cold-blooded. It doesn't move too much. That's a great thing for growing protein. But if you've got this crazy wild creature that swims at 40 miles an hour and heats its blood, not a great uh, candidate for aquaculture. The next creature, uh, most consumed seafood in America um, um, and throughout the West is salmon. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions.
Now, salmon got its plundering too, but it didn't really necessarily happen through fishing. This is my home state of Connecticut. Connecticut used to be home to a lot of wild salmon. But if you look at this map of Connecticut, every dot on that map is a dam. There are over 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut. I, I often say this is why people in Connecticut are so so uptight.、Um, <laughs> uh, it, if somebody could just unblock Connecticut's chi, I feel that we could have an infinitely better world. But I made this particular comment at a, co- a convention once of national parks officers, and this guy from North Carolina sidled up to me. He says, "You know, you oughtn't be so hard on your Connecticut, because we here in North Carolina." We got 35,000 dams, so it's a national epidemic. It's an international epidemic, and there are dams everywhere. And these are precisely the things that stop wild salmon from reaching their spawning grounds. So as a result, we've turned to aquaculture grounds. So as a result, we've turned to aquaculture, and salmon is one of the most successful, at least from a numbers point of view. When they first started farming salmon, it could take as many as six pounds of wild fish to make a single pound of salmon. The industry has, to its credit, greatly improved. They've gotten it below two to one. Although, it's a little bit of a cheat because if you look at the way aquaculture feed is produced, they're measuring pellets, pounds of pellets per pound of salmon. Those pellets are in turn reduced fish. So the actual, what's called the FIFA, the fish in and the fish out, kind of hard to say. But in any case, credit to the industry, it has lowered the amount of fish per pound of salmon. Problem is, we've also gone crazy with the amount of salmon that we're producing. Aquaculture is the fastest-growing food system on the planet. It's growing at something like seven percent per year. And so, even though、uh, we're doing less per fish、um, to bring it to the market, we're still killing a lot of these little fish. And if, we're also feeding fish to chickens and pigs. So we have chickens, and they're eating fish. But weirdly, we also have fish that are eating chickens uh, because uh, the byproducts of chickens' feathers, blood, bone. Get ground up and fed to fish. So I often wonder: Is there a fish that ate a chicken that ate a fish? <laughs> This is sort of a reworking of the chicken and egg thing. Anyway, <laughs> altogether, though, it results in a terrible mess.、Um, what you're talking about is something between 20 and 30 million metric tons of wild creatures that are taken from the ocean and used and ground up. That's the equivalent of a third of a China. Or of entire United States of humans that's taken out of the sea each and every year. The last of the four is a kind of amorphous thing.、Um, it's you know what the industry calls white fish. There's many fish that get cycled into this white fish thing, but the way to kind of tell the story, I think, is through that classic piece of American culinary inv- innovation. Culinary inv- innovation, the、uh, fillet of fish sandwich. So the fillet of fish sandwich actually started as halibut, and it started because a local franchise owner found. That when he served his McDonald's on on Friday, nobody came, because it was a Catholic community. They needed fish. So Ray Kroc,、um, he went to Ray Kroc and he said, "I'm going to bring you a fish sandwich. It's going to be made out of halibut." Ray Kroc said, "I don't think it's going to work. I want to do a hula burger, and there's going to be a, a slice of pineapple on a bun. But let's do this. Let's have a bet. Who's ever sandwich, you know, sells more, that will be the winning sandwich." Well, it's kind of sad for the ocean that the hula burger didn't win. Um, so he made his halibut sandwich.、Uh, unfortunately, though, the sandwich came in at 30 cents. Ray wanted the sandwich to come in at 25 cents, so he turned to Atlantic cod. We all know what happened to Atlantic cod in New England. So now the fillet of fish sandwich is made out of Alaska pollock. It's the largest fin fish fishery in the United States. Two to three billion pounds of fish taken out of the sea every billion pounds of fish taken out of the sea every single year. If we go through the pollock. The next choice is probably going to be tilapia. Tilapia is one of those fish nobody ever heard of 20 years ago.、Um, it's actually a very efficient converter of plant protein into animal protein, and it's been a godsend to the third world. It's actually a tremendously sustainable solution.、It、goes from an egg to an adult in nine months. Problem is that when you look about the West, it doesn't do what the West wants it to do. It really doesn't have what's called an oily fish profile. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. First you have some time to look at questions. But the question is why? Why do we sometimes fail to perform up to our potential under pressure? It's especially bewildering in the case of athletes who spend so much time physically honing their craft. But what about their minds? Not as much. This is true off the playing field as well. Whether we're taking a test or giving a talk, it's easy to feel like we're ready at the top of our game and then perform at our worst when it matters most. It turns out that rarely do we practice under the types of conditions we're actually going to perform under, and as a result, when all eyes are on us, we sometimes flub our performance. Of course, the question is, why is this the case? And my experience on the playing field and in other important facets of my life, really pushed me into the field of cognitive science. I wanted to know how we could reach our limitless potential. I wanted to understand how we could use our knowledge of the mind and the brain to come up with psychological tools that would help us perform at our best. So why does it happen? Why do we sometimes fail to perform up to what we're capable of when the pressure is on? It may not be so surprising to hear that in stressful situations, we worry. We worry about the situation, the consequences, what others will think of us. But what is surprising is that we often get in our own way, precisely because our worries prompt us to concentrate too much. That's right, we pay too much attention to what we're doing. When we're concerned about performing our best, we often try and control aspects of what we're doing that are best left on autopilot, outside conscious awareness, and as a result, we mess up. Think about a situation where you're shuffling down the stairs, and what would happen if I asked you to think about what you're doing with your knee while you're doing that? There's a good chance you'd fall on your face. We as humans only have the ability to pay attention to so much at once, which is why, by the way, it's not a good idea to drive and talk on the cell phone. And under pressure, when we're concerned about performing at our best, we can try and control aspects of what we're doing that should be left outside conscious control. The end result is that we mess up. My research team and I have studied this phenomenon of overattention, and we call it paralysis by analysis. In one study, we asked college soccer players to dribble a soccer ball and to pay attention to an aspect of their performance that they would not otherwise attend to. We asked them to pay attention to what side of the foot was contacting the ball. We showed that performance was slower and more error-prone when we drew their attention to the step-by-step -step details of what they were doing. When the pressure is on, we're often concerned with performing at our best, and as a result, we try and control what we're doing to force the best performance. The end result is that we actually screw up. In basketball, the term unconscious is used to describe a shooter who can't miss. And San Antonio Spurs star Tim Duncan has said, when you have to stop and think, that's when you mess up. In dance, the great choreographer George Balanchine used to urge his dancers, don't think, just do. When the pressure's on, when we want to put our best foot forward, somewhat ironically, we often try and control what we're doing in a way that leads to worse performance. So what do we do? Knowing that we have this overactive attention, how do we ensure that we perform at our best? 
a lot of it comes down to the prefrontal cortex, that front part of our brain that sits over our eyes and usually helps us focus in positive ways. It often gets hooked on the wrong things. So how do we unhook it? Something as simple as singing a song or paying attention to one's pinky toe, as pro golfer Jack Nicklaus was rumored to do, can help us take our mind off those pesky details. It's also true that practicing under conditions that we're going to perform under, closing the gap between training and competition, can help us get used to that feeling of all eyes on us. This is true off the playing field as well. Whether it's getting ready for an exam or preparing for a big talk, one that might have a little pressure associated with it, Getting used to the types of situations you're going to perform under really matters. When you're taking a test, close the book. Practice retrieving the answer from memory under time situations. And when you're giving a talk, practice in front of others. And if you can't find anyone who will listen, practice in front of a video camera or even a mirror. The ability to get used to what it will feel like can make the difference in whether we choke or thrive. We've also figured out some ways to get rid of those pesky worries and self-doubts that tend to creep up in the stressful situations. Researchers have shown that simply jotting down your thoughts and worries before a stressful event can help to download them from mind, make them less likely to pop up in the moment. It's kind of like when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're really worried about what you have to do the next day, you're trying to think about everything you have to accomplish, and you write it down, and then you can go back to sleep. Journaling or getting those thoughts down on paper makes it less likely they'll pop up and distract you in the moment. The end result is that you can perform your best when it matters most. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.